All right, well, I've, I've already told you that I've read our text, so now let's kind of dive into it and get a little bit of a running start because it's been a little while since we've been in the book of Acts. Uh, I think we stopped sometime in October. We started the Reformation series, which ended up being so, I think, about 12 weeks or so long. Uh, we were trying to coordinate that in the morning, and then we went into a series on the Sabbath. And now we return uh, to the book of Acts. And again, what we want to see as we go through here is not just that these things happened, but we want to see what we can learn from these things, you know, how, the, how these things can help us do what the Lord has called us to do. So with that in mind, again, we come back to the book of Acts. And remember that the book of Acts is an inspired history, inspired record of the missionary efforts of the early church. Uh, primarily those of the Apostle Paul and those working with him. Essentially, the continuing work of Jesus Christ through his apostles to reach the Jew first, but then also the Gentiles. We know that it covers roughly the 40-year period between the resurrection of Christ and God's judgment on the Jews in 70 AD. Now, it doesn't contain that record because it closes perhaps a couple of years uh, before that event takes place. Now, last time we left Paul in the city of Athens, where he had given his powerful defense of the Christian faith to the philosophers on Mars Hill. And remember, we tried to kind of correlate what he was doing with what R.C. Sproul had taken us through with regard to the defense of the faith and tried to learn various things on how we might defend the faith. And I thought that, that this defense would be a good example for us just simply to review the nuts and bolts, so let me do this briefly. Paul, first of all, found a starting point in their culture, you know, the statue to the unknown God. And we need to realize that that statue was there because of God's general revelation in nature. They knew he existed, they just didn't know his name. And so they added him among the pantheon. They had many misunderstandings, but at least they knew that God was. And then Paul draws their attention to this God's goodness and giving them various lands and appointing them their kingdoms and providing for them each and every day from His goodness. And we know that the goodness and the kindness of God is meant to lead men to repentance. He is not only God, but He's a good God. Then he answered the questions their philosophers had raised, and we're not going to get into those because they're a little bit detailed, but he even drew from their own literature, you know, comments that would buttress his argument. So he satisfies uh, the, the things that they were after, as it were, the, uh, the things they just couldn't answer. He answered those questions. And then he brings the gospel home. Some people think that Paul didn't preach the gospel at, at the Areopagus, but he actually did. He first of all told them they needed to turn from their idols to the living God because he had appointed a day in which he was going to judge all mankind through his Son, having proven that he will by raising him from the dead. And, you know, again, I don't think all the words that Paul spoke are necessarily recorded here. I do believe he got the gospel out. And we do know that after he talked about the resurrection, they scoffed. But there were those who listened. There were those who believed. God gathered. He saved those who belonged to him from that very hardened crowd. And the point, of course, is we do need to be able to defend what it is we believe. We do believe it's defensible. As a matter of fact, it's the only defensible position that exists. Everything else that people believe is a, is a fantasy, is a fairy tale. Only really, um, again, what the Lord tells us about Himself in the Word and about the Christian faith is the only rational, the only reasonable explanation for everything that is. But the point here is this that when we are faithful to share the gospel with other people, the Lord will call His own home. Sometimes we give up too quickly. Sometimes we think we fail with a few people that no one's going to be saved through us, and so why should we bother? Well, we're going to see this morning in our text that if Paul had that attitude, <laughs> he would have given up a long time ago, and a lot of people wouldn't have been saved. Okay, so now with his work done in Athens, Paul sets his sights on the city of Corinth. Corinth, the seat of the Roman government for southern Greece, which is Achaia. Now, we first see him join up with Aquila and Priscilla. We read in verses 1 through 3. After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. 
And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. Now Luke begins by introducing us to Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila was a Jew from Pontus. Pontus, uh, if you remember your geography, don't have any uh, graphics to show you, but is north of Galatia. It's an area where some of the Jews had settled in the dispersion, apparently a significant number of them. Now, he had recently come to Corinth with his wife Priscilla because Claudius Caesar had driven the Jews out of Rome. I don't think it's a mystery, but uh, Jews were generally hated by the Romans. Matthew Henry writes, Suetonius, who was a Roman historian, in the life of Claudius, speaks of this decree in the ninth year of his reign and says, the reason was because the Jews were a turbulent people and that it was upon the account of Christ. Some zealous for him, others bitter against him, which occasioned great heats such as annoyed the government and provoked the emperor, who was a timorous, jealous man, to order them all to be gone. Now, I think this, this statement not only tells us something about the Jews, but it also tells us um, about the fact that the Romans were at a place at this time where they still couldn't tell who were the Christians and, and who were the Jews. Notice that all the Jews were turbulent, and some of them were zealous for Christ, and some of them were bitter against them, but they considered them all to be Jews of the Jewish faith, and that's the reason why they were all tolerated. But we also know that there was going to come a time when they would understand, as the Jews persecuted the Christians, that the Christians were not a part of the Jewish faith and therefore not a legal religion, and Rome would begin to persecute them on that basis. But that time had not yet come. Now, Aquila and Priscilla were tent makers by trade, and Paul, having this same skill, began to work with them. Uh, one thing that maybe we understand, maybe we don't, is that the Jews believe that their children should all have a trade and should have this trade in addition to a vocation in order to fall back on in case their vocation should fail. I mean, a trade is something you can always do, certain things you can't always do. Again, Henry writes this in his commentary, Dr. Lightfoot, who was a, an expert in his days on Jewish traditions, belief, the Talmud, and so forth, shows that it was the custom of the Jews to bring up their children to some trade, though they gave them learning or estates. Rabbi Judah says, he that teaches not his son a trade is as if he taught him to be a thief. And another says, he that has a trade in his hand is as a vineyard that is fenced. So basically, you know, we, we think about, you know, encouraging our children to go one direction, you know, let's go to college, learn, learn a vocation. But some kind of hands-on experience, he was saying, was something that you could do if the other fails. And I think there's wisdom in that. But that's why Paul had this particular skill. He was a rabbi by profession, but he had also learned the art of making tents. And here we see that particular training come in handy. You know, I, I couldn't help but think as, as I'm looking at the fact they're making tents that, that missionaries do something very similar. You know, there are countries that will not allow uh, religious workers missionaries, we might say Paul is a rabbi, uh, to enter in order to do this work because they don't want this kind of work being done in their country. But they will allow them to come in if they do something else, maybe like teach English uh, with ELIC, um, uh, working in the universities, uh, somewhat undercover, but um, we understand that um, to promote the kingdom of heaven is more important than keeping unrighteous and ungodly laws. We must speak about Christ, even when the leaders of, of Israel told the disciples, no longer teach and preach in this name. They couldn't obey that because the Lord had told them to speak. They needed to do that. So again, they enter into the country under another profession, and not only does this 
skill, this, this other vocation, uh, help support them while they're there. It gives them the opportunities to build relationships in which they might share the gospel. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why many missionaries go into countries like this to teach. Because when you teach, you get to interact with people. And they can ask questions, and you can answer questions, and you can share the gospel in that way. Now, this is similar to what it was for Paul. The tent making was not the main reason why he was there. It was a means to an end. The end of bringing the gospel to the Corinthian people. So we read in verse 4, and he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. By the way, that word persuade, you know, it wasn't that he just said, here's the gospel, take it or leave it. But there was also that desire to try to persuade them this was true, try to reason with them. There was always this defense of the faith. Now, we, we must, I think we have to assume that he not only went to the synagogues on, on the Sabbath in order to minister to the Jews that were gathered there, but Paul would share the gospel wherever and whenever he had the opportunity. Um, think about those coming to buy tents. I imagine Paul would share the gospel with them. When he went out to buy materials for his tents, I'm sure that he had opportunities there as well. And, of course, he would go out to the local markets and he would speak to the people gathered there. Now, this is simply to remind us that we don't have to have the vocation of a full-time evangelist in order to share the gospel. We have plenty of opportunities in our day-to-day -day life. We just simply need to be looking for them. We need to be ready when they come. And I think above all things, we need to have the desire to bring the gospel to other people some concern for the fact that if they don't hear these things, they are going to be destroyed ultimately. And actually, we're going to look at it even a more serious consideration in just a moment. Now, when Silas and Timothy arrived, Paul was able to give his full time now to the work, and the kingdom continued to advance. We read in verse 5, but when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the Word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And again, here we have him beginning with the Jews, since God promised Messiah to the Jewish people. Remember, it was the fulfillment of His promise to Abraham. They must be the first to hear of Him. And so everywhere Paul goes throughout the Roman Empire, he goes first to where the Jews are because of this promise. And that, I believe, at least until 70 AD, when the Lord finally puts His old covenant people away. And it's clear now the church is the people He has joined Himself with. But notice that these people, these Jews, reject Jesus. Verse 6, but when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. By the way, did, did Paul or Jesus or anyone ever say some relatively harsh words to the people that he was ministering to? Well, when they reject Jesus, that is often you know, the, the appropriate thing to do. Now, notice that Paul gave them the same symbolic gesture that Jesus had given to his disciples. Remember, he goes, when you, he sent them out to preach in the towns and villages around Palestine, and he says, if they don't receive you or listen to you when you leave, shake the dust off your feet, shake the dust from your garments. And what it meant was that because you have refused to listen to God, God will no longer listen to you. This was casting them off in the same way that he was getting rid of the dust, even the dust that clung to his clothing as a testimony against them. Paul says their blood would be on their own heads. And we know what that means is that they would bear the responsibility for their own destruction. Paul was not to blame. Paul was clean. He was free from the guilt of this because he had not failed to warn them of the truth. By the way, there is a sense in which this also applies to us, and, and this can be kind of heavy. You know, God tells us that we are also to warn other people. Now, not full-time, all-time, everywhere, 
uh, in the sense of we give up what we're doing, everything else, drop everything and, and go and warn people, though um, some people may do that. But when God gives us clear opportunities to share His gospel, clear opportunities, relationships with family members, relationships with people, our neighbors, and people with whom we work, if we have an established relationship and we spend time with them all the time, and we never really get around to sharing the gospel with them, let's say that that individual never actually hears the gospel from anyone else, and they eventually die. Well, what's going to happen to them? Without Christ, they're going to perish. And we're going to be partly responsible. That's what Paul meant by this. I'm not responsible because I've told you, I've warned you. You've rejected it. You're, the responsibility is on you now. Well, the same thing could be true of us. And the reason I bring this up is because we really do need to think about those opportunities. Love should motivate us, but it's not the only motivator. I mean, this is another motivation. What's going to happen to them if we fail? And what is that going to say about us? Now, let me just say this too. God forgives us when we fail. And we've all failed. We've all failed to do this. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins, He carried all of our sins, even our sins of failing in this area. But we don't want to let that excuse us from what the Lord calls us to do because souls are at stake. Again, remember what I read of Spurgeon. If we can't get them to turn, at least shed a tear for them. That's the kind of desire, that's the kind of affection that we should have even for the lost. Now, at this point, Paul turns to the Gentiles. Okay, this was also God's plan. If the Jews rejected Jesus, then the gospel was to come to them, and the reason it was to come to them was in order to provoke them. Paul writes in Romans 11, verse 11, by their transgression, the Jews, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Why? To make them jealous. And I think maybe we see a little bit of that dynamic going on here, possibly. Luke writes in verse 7, Then Paul left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Titius was a Gentile who had converted to Judaism. That's what it means that he was a worshiper of God. But now he was a brother in Christ. And so Paul would use that as his base of operations. Now, whether it was because he turned to the Gentiles or if it was because of his ministry in the synagogue, we read that the Lord actually did have some mercy, I should say mercy, on some of the Jews. Look at what we see in verse 8. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. It's always a blessing, isn't it, when the whole household comes to faith in Christ. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. Now, here was at least one Jewish family that came to Christ, perhaps because, again, of this provocation of going to the Gentiles, perhaps because of Paul's ministry. But also, many of the Corinthians, this turn to the Gentiles was bringing about the salvation of many people who believed and were baptized. Now, let's, again, pause and think about what this teaches us. If Paul had given up right away because of the rejection of the Jews, if he stopped whenever there was a little bit of difficulty, not much would have been accomplished. But Paul persevered. He persevered through the hardships because he knew that if he did, he would see the Lord's blessing. And now he was seeing it. The church was being built. God was blessing. And the fact is, we do need to persevere in sharing the gospel if we are to see the fulfillment of His promises. The Lord often, I would say, at least in my experience, is almost exclusively, whenever you begin to, to move in a positive direction like that, and you begin to share the faith with someone, the immediate reaction of that someone is going to be resistance. You know, it's, they're going to fight back. There's going to be this backlash. And the question is, how are we going to respond to it? Are we just going to give up? Well, they... Obviously, they're not elect. Obviously, they're not going to be saved. Or do we say, well, these things take time, don't they? Sometimes some, someone tried to calculate how many times a person needs to hear the gospel before they'll be saved, and we, we can't do that. But I think it was instructive, at least in, in this way, that, that usually people don't come to faith in Christ the first time they hear it. They have to hear it several times. They have to see it being 
lived out in our lives. And I think that's what we see here also in the Apostle Paul. But you know, the Lord didn't leave it just with the results. He also encouraged Paul in other ways. He, I think he um, revealed to him a bit of his plan to encourage him. We read in verses 9 through 11, And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the Word of God among them. Now, I think if we think that Paul was never afraid, and that's kind of how it seems, you know, especially as he faced the Jews numerous times and the beatings and all the various imprisonments, we might think that Paul was a man without fear. But you know, that isn't the case. He actually was afraid. The Lord told him to stop fearing. And you can't really stop something that you haven't started doing, right? Remember what Suetonius wrote a little bit earlier? The Jews were a turbulent people. Okay? They could react very strongly. Remember what they did to Jesus. So to help him, the Lord did three things, I think. Uh, and uh, I think these three things should also be encouraging for us. First of all, he said to Paul, I am with you. As Jesus promised to be with his disciples as he sent them out to do the, the, the Great Commission, he reaffirms that he will also be with Paul, okay? I am with you. Secondly, he gave Paul a promise. No man will attack you to harm you. Well, that, that's a wonderful promise, isn't it? Especially after what Paul went through. God is the one who controls the hearts and the actions of all men. And he turns them whichever way he chooses. And here he tells Paul that he's going to restrain them. Now, God doesn't always restrain them. We might ask the question, why? Why not? You know, why doesn't he always restrain? Because he also has a good purpose in persecution. And through that persecution, he also brings people to faith. But in this case, Paul, while you're here, <laughs> no one's going to hurt you. That, that would be a great encouragement. And then thirdly, the reason he was doing this is because he says, I have many people in this city. And I don't think he means by that, well, look, you've already seen how many people I've saved. You've got all these people on your side, you know, and they're going to be there to support you. I don't think that's what he means. But what I think he means is this, many of my sheep whom I've chosen to give to my son for the work that he has done, they are yet to be gathered out of the city, and there are many of them. And for that reason, I'm going to protect you so that you can reach them. And we see that that promise had a, the desired effect on Paul. Paul believed God. Does that sound familiar? He trusted God. And on the basis of that promise, he stayed for 18 more months, preaching the gospel and teaching the new converts. Now, as I said, this can also be an encouragement for us, right? Because the Lord promises that he's going to be with us. He also promises He's not going to let anything happen in our lives that isn't specifically for our good and for the advancement of His kingdom. And the Lord hasn't come yet, which means that there are still plenty of people to be reached. So there are many people in the city of Modesto, in Ceres, Salida, Riverbank, Oakdale, Ripon, that are yet to be reached. And because God wants to reach them through us, we can also have the confidence that Jesus had confidence that Paul had, the confidence that George Whitfield had, who all believed that God is sovereign in these, these, this manner or in this area, we can have the confidence that God actually will save people through our testimony, through our witness, through our sharing the gospel. Now, finally, we see that protection doesn't necessarily mean there will be no suffering at all, okay? Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We read in verses 12 through 13, But while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, the Lord, as I mentioned before, for his good purposes, sometimes lowers the shield of protection 
But I think we have to say he never lowers it completely. Even if our life should be taken, he's still going to take us to the place of ultimate safety. But he did say no one was going to hurt Paul, and he kept that promise, okay, because Paul doesn't actually get hurt here. But he does lower the shield and allows him to be taken into custody and brought before the proconsul Gallio. Now, he was the Roman official who was in charge of that area. And by the way, Gallio was also the older brother of Seneca. Seneca is the famous Roman Stoic philosopher and orator. And this may have been, you know, may have been one of the factors behind why the Jews did this, and we'll see that in just a moment. And they began to accuse him, likely thinking that he would side with them. One thing the Stoics believed or I should say rejected, as we saw in the Areopagus, right, on Mars Hill, when Paul was in Athens, they rejected the resurrection. They, they scoffed at it, and perhaps the Jews, thinking that Gallio was, was probably, you know, influenced by Seneca, his brother, and perhaps he would also have this reaction, and maybe it would work to their advantage. Well, what they did was they brought an accusation that his teaching was contrary to their belief system, to the law of Moses. And in one sense, they, they were right. He wasn't advocating drawing near to God through animal sacrifices and the Aaronic priesthood. But in another, they were wrong. The Lord had fulfilled these things, what they truly meant through His Son. And now we must all approach Him through Jesus, through His sacrifice, or God won't receive us at all. It was a false accusation. But the Lord, again, keeping to His promise, raised up unexpected help from the proconsul himself. We read in verses 14 through 16. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, probably thinking, okay, here's another providential opportunity to preach the gospel, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names and your own law, look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. Well, Gallio didn't see this as a government matter. Paul hadn't broken any Roman law. He just had a disagreement with these religious leaders. This was an in-house debate. Didn't concern him. And so he basically drove them out of the, away from the judgment seat, and again, Paul was spared. God's protection, what Jesus said, came, came to pass. He wasn't harmed. No man will injure you. He was uninjured. So again, the Lord protects us when we do His work. But, but there's one last thing that we, we can't overlook here, and that is how the Lord used this event to bring another hardened Jew to faith in Christ. Uh, the last verse says this. It seems somewhat strange, so we'll try to understand it. And they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. Again, hey, that's, that's your problem. You deal with it. That's the way you want to deal with it. Even though they probably should have done something to this effect, hey, you're breaking the law by, by uh, you know, assaulting this person. But, but who is Sosthenes, okay? Why did they beat him? Now, it does say here that he was the leader of the synagogue. We read earlier that Crispus was the leader of the synagogue. It appears that Crispus, because he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was replaced by Sosthenes. He's the new leader of the synagogue. And so why was he beaten? So he, here's, here's the question. Uh, one theory is this. Either he was the main instigator of the persecution, he's the one that stirred up the mob that took Paul and dragged him before, the, before Gallio, and, and when he failed to get Gallio to listen, the mob turned on him, which would not be an uncommon thing, and they took it out on him. That, that's quite possible. Or he also was a convert to Christ and a friend of Paul, and that's why he was beaten by the Jews. That, that seems to be perhaps a more favorable way of looking at it, until we consider a couple of things. For one thing, he was the current leader of the synagogue. Now, how could he do that? How could he be a Christian and be the current leader of the synagogue unless he was an undercover Christian? But we're not supposed to be undercover Christians. We're supposed to share our Christianity with others. But secondly, notice they beat him and they didn't beat Paul. Why didn't they take Paul and beat, you know, 
beat him before the proconsul. The fact that they didn't seems to throw weight behind this first position, that they were upset with Sosthenes because he wasn't able to carry out their plan. It failed. But whether it's one or the other, we do know at least this much, this is the same Sosthenes who later becomes a believer and with Paul sends a letter to the Corinthians. If you read the beginning of 1 Corinthians 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of God, with Sosthenes, okay? At some point, Sosthenes actually becomes a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? It could have been because of this beating. When your own people turn against you, you know? The Lord has so many different ways of bringing people to faith in Him. Some of them are easy. You know, you share the gospel, they believe, and they're saved. Others have to go through a very, very difficult time before they actually are saved. And, and, you know, humanly speaking, there's reasons why the Lord does that. Sometimes He has to drive people out of their self-sufficiency, out of the things that they trust in and they're relying on now to bring them, as it were, to the bottom in order that they might begin to look up. You know, other people, it seems like the Lord can humble them quickly. Others, it, it does take a long time. But we do know this. He will bring us to Himself one way or the other if that is His desire. Okay, we also know that even if it's the hard way, it's worth it. It's worth it for us. It's worth it for others. So let's not give up too quickly. Okay, let's not give up on anyone, really. And continue to pray, continue to share the gospel as you have opportunity, even if they tell you they don't want to hear about it anymore. You know, keep praying for them shed a tear for them, desire their salvation, and perhaps we'll see the Lord work in their lives to bring them to faith in Himself. Well, let's uh, bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's, um, let's ask the Lord to, to apply some of the things that we've heard and to help us use these things to reach out to others.